Yes. Every couple of nights, John comes in here to talk about all the UFO news going on. And a lot of it tonight is surrounding Luis Elizondo and a major book that just came out from George Knapp, Colm Kelleher, and the predecessor to Elizondo at the Pentagon, a gentleman by the name of, oh, I got it here somewhere. There it is, James Lekatsky, Dr. James Lekatsky. John, welcome back, buddy. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for sticking around. We do appreciate it. Tonight's going to be, uh, at least for me anyway, a little exciting. Hopefully you guys enjoy it too. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot going on, and, and we're only going to be able to cover it briefly, so I do apologize, but it'll all be in the notes, and I encourage you guys all to you know, research all this to your heart's content because it's some fun stuff going on. So uh, first off, you know what, what Dave's talking about is this um, – you know, amazing book that just came out um, called uh, uh, Skinwalker, uh, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. And um, this book is, um, it's, it's quite the book. Um, so I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I, I will say this. I've only been able to read snippets of it. So, um, but essentially this is a, this is very much like what Elizondo talked about, about when, when Louis Elizondo talked about how, writing his own book, how he wanted to give you the kind of the inside baseball of what he'd experienced running a tip. This is essentially his predecessors exact same book, giving the inside baseball of what happened before Lou Elizondo took over. Um, and so it covers some very interesting material and just to kind of put out a beautiful teaser. Uh, one of the things it specifically talks about is uh, stories that uh, Mr. Elizondo told at a dinner table about the fact that he actually applied remote viewing techniques to save him from a very dangerous situation while he was over in the sandbox. So um, it's it's quite an interesting book, and um, I, I, I encourage everyone to check it out. It's fun stuff. Have you seen any of it, Dave? I have read a few quotes on on the on the side of it. The one thing that I'm I'm very noticing that about this book, and I don't know if they're trying to straighten the level on everything or they're trying to create a little controversy here. But when the two of the Stars Academy announced Luis Elizondo, we really were led to believe that he was the big man on campus regarding this phenomena. And what this book really states is that Lou was a major player in the game, but ATIP, the program that he ran, was literally below this group called OSAP that we've even heard about. And OSAP got all the funding. ATIP really didn't get much money. And, you know, they weren't really communicating at all. Well, I, I think a lot of it comes down to interpretation because that's not how, uh, you know, if, if basically there, there's an interview that, uh, that George Knapp did with this other with two other co-authors that was released yesterday on Mystery Wire. I'll, I'll, I'll give a link to, to that, too. They specifically talked about this. And and Dr. James Lekatsky. Uh, basically like laid this out very clearly and, and he's, he's very specific about it. And basically what it was, was that, you know, OSAP was essentially, um, and, oh, you know what? I'm, one thing I'm blanking on is I can't remember if OSAP was under DISA or was under, um, DIA or if it was under, uh, I think it was DIA, um, was, was basically under, under, a, you know, a, 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 a generalized group in a way. And, um, and, and OSAP was the primary organization, as you said, the one that got the 22 million. ATIP was just kind of a nickname for it, right? And it wasn't like an official name of any sorts. And one thing he states very specifically is there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the point of OSAP was to investigate UFOs. And he lays that out point blank in this interview. And But the other thing he says is then at a later date, when that program got moved from uh, from its previous place into the office of the undersecretary. At that point, that program then took on the nickname as its primary name, and ATIP was formed in the office of the undersecretary. That's when Elizondo took it over because he was a director in the office of the undersecretary of defense. And that program didn't have any funding. However, from my experience, let's just say from my personal experience with the, with the government, um, I would consider its place within the office of the Undersecretary of Defense to be much higher up the chain of command than where it was when it was OSAP. 
because under OSAP, it wasn't even in the office of the Undersecretary of Defense. It was in one of the it was in one of the branches. I mean, it was it was in one of the the, the command sort of thing structures. And so essentially, that's that's the whole reason why I'm excited about this bill talking about moving it from the office of the undersecretary to the secretary of defense, because that's a whole nother level up from where it is now and from the undersecretary to the secretary. And so to me, what level you're at means a lot more than whether you're funded or not. All right, moving on. Lou also came out with a five pillars approach to trying to bring the UAP topic to the mainstream in a core presentation that he's released. So this is, uh, for those of you that have been following the baseball game closely, this is the presentation we've been waiting for that Lou gave at um, uh, uh, San, uh, San Marino, I think it's pronounced, um, uh, where, you know, where he, he basically did that talk a while ago. And um, and this is a presentation we've been waiting for. Um, originally, we were told that, that we would get a recording of it. I guess, I don't know. I haven't checked. I guess something went wrong with that recording. And so um, Lou basically got on um, with uh, this UK group um, uh, called, um, uh, oh, now I'm, now I'm blanking on their name. I apologize. I'm too excited about the AI stuff. Um, but basically, um, uh, it's called um, uh, Disclosure... And I'll post a link to it. It's like it's like the it's I think it's like disclosure now or disclosure. Um, it, it they're on Twitter, and I'll, I'll post a link to it. And it's not it's actually not a web channel that I was familiar with. This is my first introduction to them. But Lou is on that uh, on that web show today uh, on YouTube, and basically he gave this presentation. And this presentation was super cool for two you know for two very specific reasons. One is like you said, he basically gave the the core presentation of what his pillars are. Um, you know, what he's been talking about for a long time. So he talked about how, you know, the first step was legislative, the second step was executive, the third step was international, the fourth step was media, um, mainstream media engagement, the fifth step was public engagement. Uh, he talks about um, the, the achievements of the five pillars since 2017. And I mean, this is a, it's not numbered, but, and I'll supply this in my notes, but this is a hell of a hit list. If, if anyone asks you, what's, what have we achieved in the last five years? This is just an itemized list of boom, 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 boom. Go over some of those. Um, things like um, uh, Japan um, requesting for bilateral information exchange concerning UAPs. Congress mandated to a UAP report every uh, 90 days. Um, one of the largest uh, collaborative IC virtual environments being created to analyze UAP data. The one I'm most excited about is the fact that, um, uh, what is the group that the... Um, um uh oh i can't remember i can't can't find the name of it right now but basically two um academic institutions within the within the de defense framework have started accepting thesis statements uh you know th uh, accepting thesis for the uap so now we're actually having academic exception uh, acceptance of of uap studies within the defense you know school framework um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a great, it's a great list to, to someone should make a poster or a t-shirt or something. Um, and, um, and then he, when he talks about essentially what they're looking for in the creation of a, of a federal national laboratory that, you know, um, that can basically take advantage of all the different, um, assets. And, um, it's, 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 a, it's a really good, short, clean presentation. And, um, I, um, I, I, um, you know, I, I probably should have asked his permission first, but I'm 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 qu I'm quoting him and crediting him every chance I get. Um, but basically, I took screenshots of the presentation and just put them together into a PDF document, just for just because I like to have the notes as I'm watching the presentation. And um, and so it's it's a short little presentation. I'll I'll provide a link to the presentation. I'll also provide a link to my PDF document. And, um, you know, if you guys pass it around, make sure not to take the disclosure team's little logo off the slides because those guys do deserve credit for being the ones that broke the story. But um, it's, it's, it's good stuff. And what it leads into is finally the AI stuff. But I'm sorry, I got really excited and kept talking, Dave, please. That's please. all right. Let's go into the AI stuff. What do you got for us there? Oh man, this is, this is, um, so first off, let me just say that I, I, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't lead you guys astray in, in what I described before. Um, it, it's, this is just basically documentation of exactly what I talked before, but I'll, I'll go over it again briefly. So what this is, it's several slides that shows exactly how the software is going to work. 
So the first thing you see is an example case study, which is a, a, a rather poor quality video of an object in the distance. However, um, Lou does say that the, the real video was much clearer. They just had to down rev the, the resolution to put it to the presentation. And from that presentation, they pull out a still. And if you look at this still, man, it it looks like a bloody UFO. I mean, it's it 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 gets you right off the bat. I mean, it, it pulls you in immediately. And then on the next slide, what you see is the first stage that the that the algorithm goes through, the machine learning, or I guess we'll call it artificial intelligence, because that's how people like to name it now. Um, uh, you know, the system goes through. The first thing it does is is identifies anomalies on the ridge that shouldn't be there based on the foliage that exists and the location that exists at that place. It also then does an analysis of the object and it finds protrusions from that object. In the next stage, it assigns probabilities to each of the objects on the horizon. So it says, I think that this shape you're seeing here is the tail of an F-35 lightning. And I assign the probability of that prediction to 85%. This is likely the tail of a C-17 global master, probability 94%. So it apply, It not only shows you what these things are, but it gives you its confidence levels. And then it looks at the protrusions in the object and takes a guess as to what they might be. And then basically it crunches all this information and it basically says, uh, actually, it's a tent. And that's what it was. It was actually an army tent that had been put up on stilts. And so it's it's a beautiful example of of how this is going to because one of the one of the things we have to start doing, we have to start doing this community is failing fast. Once something is not, a, we can determine it's not a UAP, we have to mark it as not you and get it the hell out of the way and move on to the next thing because we spend, I mean, just tonight on, on, uh, on another big show that's, that's, um, that, you know, probably some of you listen to, you know, they had, um, uh, this big physicist on, right. And they spent half the show talking about the Tic Tac case. I mean, how long have we been talking about this case, right? We have to start failing fast and moving on. And that's what this tool is going to do. Now, one thing I just want to say really quick is that um, on the last slide for the AI stuff, Lou lists out the strengths and limitations of this AI tool. And I wanted, I, I need to call out one thing that I think that, that with respect, Lou did get wrong. And that is that in, the, in the, the last item of the strengths, he lists it as being bias neutral. And that's unfortunately not true. Now, fortunately, he goes over at the end and talks about how important the data is you give it, how, how important it is, what data you feed it and how you teach it. And that that essentially kind of covers what he said. But what it comes down to is if you feed this thing the wrong data, you can give it biases. We've seen it. We've seen we've even seen racial biases show up in AI systems because of the way the data was fed into the system. So that bias neutral comment, that's only assumed if you are meticulously careful in the data you feed it. But he goes over the strengths and the limitations of the tool. Unfortunately, the tool is not going to be available anytime soon. But he did say that there would be mobile versions of it. There'd be a desktop version of it. There will even be a licensable version of it for people that want to take the tool and use it for other things. And so this is a this is a big project. And I am I'm really excited. I can tell. You could barely get through this one. <laughs> Barely get through John Hudson, I'm, the fedora wearing John Hudson, with another great edition of the unbiased UFO report. Let's get to Shirky Poo's news.